Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show. Call us what you will. Uh, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We also record all of our shows and they are posted onto our website for everyone to watch later. And I'll show you at the end of the show where all of that is. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, demos, mini training sessions, book reviews, uh, interviews, basically anything library related, we um, put it on the show. Uh, we have uh, guest speakers that sometimes come in and join us, both in person and remotely, and we sometimes have sessions with Nebraska Library Commission staff. And that's what we have this morning. With me today is all Library Commission staff. <laughs> um, this is the, I don't know how many, a sort of a series of things we've, of these types of shows we've been doing just this year. It's an occasional, an occasional, yes. yeah. Um, book talks, thing, books on certain topics that library commission staff have read. Um, this week, this week, this time, <laughs> our topic is mysteries. Obviously, from um, who done it, who figured it out. We probably won't give away the endings of any of these. No. <laughs> Sometimes it's obvious, it's depending true. on the mystery. Yes. <laughs> they tell you at the beginning. Right. Um, but with us today to talk about their favorite mysteries is uh, Cecilia Ramsey, over all the way over there. In the middle, Laura Johnson. And right here, Deborah Dragos, all library commission staff. So I'm just going to hand over to you guys to take it over and tell us all about uh, okay. the mysteries. Well, good morning. Um, so let's just move right into this. Um, you might need to click on to the PowerPoint with the mouse just quickly. Just one little click. There you go. Okay. Um, we're going to book talk mysteries. Uh, we'll have our contact information at the end of this if you need to contact us for some reason. Um, I thought it was very interesting. The Public Libraries Online Weekly, their little newsletter, has a poll every week. And a couple weeks ago, they asked, what genre do you prefer out of these genres? And 33 and a third percent of the respondents liked mysteries. The next most popular was nonfiction, but really? I thought this showed kind of clearly that mysteries are terribly um, popular. They're usually a big part of any library's uh, fiction collection, and um, there's an awful lot of different kinds of mysteries. So we're going to talk about several different kinds today, and we hope we'll give you a good sampling. We're going to start with Deborah. And my first title is called After the Storm by Linda Castillo. And this is the most recent in her Kate Burkholder series. Kate is the chief of police in Painters Mill, Ohio, which is right in the middle of Amish country. Kate was formerly Amish herself, but she no longer is. She does have insider knowledge into the community and the culture of the Amish, though. And that helps her in crime investigations when they involve the Amish people. Um, this latest entry starts off with sort of a, a teaser scene of, an, of a murder that occurred some years previously. And then switches to the current day and a tornado is bearing down on the community. And we all know what tornadoes are like. Well, in the cleanup afterwards, <clears throat> some bones turn up. Oh so, Kate is on the case. This is a rather dark series. It can be rather gruesome. The crimes can be rather gruesome. Um, Kate has a very uh, fraught past history uh, and still carries that baggage with her, as does her love interest, John Tomasetti. Um, in each book, you learn more about Kate and the different members of her uh, police department. Um, it's really interesting, I have found, in all of the books to follow through on uh, to finding the solution of the crime. Yeah. They're very involved, but it's, it is fast-paced. Um, often it's suspenseful. You never know. You know, there could be danger to Kate mm -hmm. or other members of her team. Um, and it's definitely not the picture of the Amish community that you get if you're used to reading Amish romance. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I find it a fascinating read. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
So you think that, that the, um, the setting contributes a lot to the overall? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, some mem member of the Amish community is, uh, is involved in every book. Ah. It's not just, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, okay. Our next thing, uh, Dry Bones by Craig Johnson. Um, this is the 11th novel in the Longmire series. There's also a book of short stories. And in this, our um, Sheriff Walt Longmire uh, from Absaroka County, Wyoming, uh, gets involved in a case where a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton has been found. Um, there's quite a bit of conflict about who owns it, uh, what's going to happen to it. And meanwhile, there's been a murder and Walt has to figure out how the murder, um, which is related to the bones. So we have lots of bones here today. Oh. Um, is uh, how it works out. Uh, Walt is his usual um, stoic self. We also have the um, overarching uh, personal story um, and there's um, more developments in that. Um, we see his um, his great friend uh, Henry Standing Bear helps him with the mystery. Um, so it's a it's an interesting uh, look once again at a Western culture. Uh, so I think it has a very double uh, appeal. Not only is it a, a nice mystery um, and well, really a procedural with a twist, I guess. Um, but it also, I think, would appeal to readers of Westerns. Um, and uh, the Longmire character, of course, is um, really an estimable uh, lawman. And uh, we all enjoy visiting with Walt and, <laughs> and the, the cast of characters. Uh, because this has been on television, and now um, they're doing, I think they're getting ready for season four with Netflix. I think it came out. Did it? Which, yeah. Okay. I do believe. It so. Geez, the entire season, boom. I, I would think there would be quite a bit <laughs> of um, um, interest in this in, in the library, simply because it has been on TV. Craig Johnson is, if not local, just a neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. And we all uh, enjoy Walt. Uh, if you want to know what all the books in this series are, uh, you can go to our um, website, the Nebraska Library Commission's website, where we have a books in series database. And it lists all the books, which I thought was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So um, if you enjoy Western, if you enjoy um, procedurals, it also does bring up the issue of um, the idea of, I don't know, would you call it, it's not really cultural remains, a Tyrannosaurus had no culture, <laughs> um, but the idea of who really owns these things mm -hmm. and how, unfortunately, they've become big business because right. they're worth a great deal of money. Um, I think you'd really enjoy this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's well written, as Johnson's books tend to be. Okay, Cecilia. As Chimney Sweepers Come to Dust by Alan Bradley. Uh, the main character, uh, Flavia de Luce, was actually introduced in um, her first book, Sweetness of the, at the Bottom of the Pie, which um, is she is an amateur chemist at the age of 11. Wow. And yes, mm -hmm. there are dead bodies, but she figures it all out. Um, it's 1950s. So there's no cell phone to help her out. Um, occasionally, she has her trusted bicycle Gladys to get her where she needs to go. Um, but the mysteries seem to just kind of drop into her lap. Uh, in this case, it's a charred skeleton uh, wrapped in a Union flag, uh, Union Jack flag that falls out of the chimney of her bedroom at her um, school. She's been sent to Canada to, to a boarding school. And just click she on that and get rid of it. Hmm? Just click on that to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, she is. Uh, I, I. What I love about her is that she's just a child, but she 
uses big words. She has great language. She, um, I mean, the title alone kind of gives you this idea that, you know, you're not talking simple in anything she does. She finds a way to uh, get to the answer, even, you know, breaking the rules a little bit, like being up after hours or um, being off, off campus. Um, but when it comes down to it, she figures out a way to sneak into places that she shouldn't and do the things that a kid would do, but she's very um, smart in how she handles it, and her chemistry always takes, her interest in chemist, chemistry always takes her to the final conclusion, but um, because you're with a child, it tends to be a little ADHD in that she will take you on other little trips and you think you figured it out and then she twists you and makes you believe it went somewhere else. Um, and this is the seventh in the series uh, and I fell in love with her from book one. Uh, I just think it's it's very, it's kind of lighthearted in the, in, because you're talking about a child, um, but she takes care of some serious business and she isn't, in this case, some of the adults, she has to figure out who she can trust and she's been warned not to talk to certain people, but then she's like, how can I figure this out if I can't talk to anybody? She figures out a way around that by having some of the other people do the talking for her. It's very clever uh, in what she does. And, and I personally am a, a listener of books, so part of, I think, what won me over to this series was the narrator. Um, I work for the Talking Books uh, and Braille service of under the Nebraska Library Commission as part of that. And so all my listeners, you know, all my readers are listeners. And so um, I was just won over by the narrator. So I thought I would share with you a little sampling of her. Is the one just to... Is it the... Right, no, there you go. Okay. We'll get to... Yeah. This is Jane Enswile whistle and she does the voice of Flavia and she's just going to give you a little hint about this particular book and introduce you to Flavia, a conversation with, that Flavia has with the character. Well, and all of that credit goes to Alan Bradley because it's, it's his heart that has created this wonderful series that all of us love so much. So now I'd like to read you a passage from his latest book, As Chimney Sweepers Come to Dust. We know Flavia has gone off to Canada to go to Miss Bodycoat's Female Academy, and in this scene she's talking to the headmistress, Miss Fallthorne. Come in, Flavia, Miss Fallthorne said in reply to my knock. I squeezed through the barely open door. Sit down, she commanded, and I obeyed, perching myself on the edge of a leather divan. First things first, she said. You will have all, no doubt, that I promised you punishment. Yes, Miss Fawthorne, I said. I'm sorry, I... She said, holding up a restraining hand. Excuses are not legal tender at Miss Bodycoat's Female Academy. Do you understand? I didn't, but I nodded anyway, imagining a red-faced magistrate in a horsehair wig glaring down at me from his elevated bench. Rules are rules. They are meant to be obeyed. Yes, Miss Fawthorne, I'm sorry. The old, old formula. It had to be played out, step by meticulous step, according to some ancient ritual. Perhaps I should have business cards printed to hand out, each embossed with my name and the words, I'm sorry, Miss Fawthorne. Every time I offended, I would pluck one from my pocket and hand it. For your punishment, I want you to write out 500 words on William Palmer. He led, I believe, an interesting life. It took a moment for the light to come on, but when it did, my brain was dazzled by the sheer brilliance of it. William Palmer? The Rougely Poisoner? Why, I could write 500. A thousand, ten thousand words on dear old, jolly old Bill Palmer, with my fingers frostbitten, my wrists handcuffed, my ankles bound, and my tongue tied behind my back. 
<laughs> that is the world of Flavia de Luz. Her imagination, her language just sucks you in. Put that, tuck that out of our way. Okay. So now we're going to go on to The Darling Dahlias and the 11 O'Clock Lady by Susan Wittig Albert. Now this is a, I've talked about a very dark series the first time. This is the total polar opposite end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a cozy mystery. Um, the series takes place in Darling, Alabama during the Great Depression. And the main characters are the women of the Darling Dahlia Gardening Club. Um, their husbands and other members of the community do show up as needed, but we do follow the ladies. And in this latest um, entry of the series, one of the town's telephone switchboard operators has been murdered. Off scene, of course, because this is a cozy. Why was she killed? What did she know? Uh-oh, did she listen in on somebody's telephone conversation? This is the 1930s, so that was an option. Um, <clears throat> as, you, as the story goes along, you discover the clues along with the dahlias as they go about their work around town. They work at the diner, or they own the diner, uh, the beauty salon, the newspaper office, the county courthouse, uh, lawyer's office, you know, wherever there's one of the dahlias. And of course, there's the new Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC camp, just outside of town. And what does that mean to the town, and what does it mean to the murder? Uh-oh, we'll find out. One of the greatest appeals of this book to me is the research that Albert has done on the Depression and how she weaves it into the story mm -hmm. and shows it to you through the characters' lives. Mm -hmm. um, it's also about women being supportive of each other and helping out the community. Um, the, the characters grow through each of the stories and you really cheer for their successes. The books are a really quick read and for me thoroughly entertaining. Like many cozies, um, at the end of the book there's extra materials. That, um, Albert always includes a historical note, but there are also some recipes. Because <laughs> you know, a gardening club, you know, town, 4th of July picnics, you always have to have yeah, mm -hmm. food, mm -hmm. celebrations, so there's always recipes. Um, but these particular books also include tips on gardening and household tips on how to save money. Because remember, this is the Depression. So how do you get by with little amount of money and limited resources? Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. OK. Um, now, we're going to go to another mystery about the 30s, although this one was written in the 30s. Uh, so she was writing contemporary um, mystery, but now, of course, it's historic. Because uh, Dorothy Sayers, one of the greats, um, one of the greats of mysteries. The golden age of mysteries. The golden age of mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, wrote a series. Her detective is Lord Peter Whimsey. Very often, he is also involved with Harriet Vane. Um, the lady he really would like to marry, but she has her reservations. Um, so five years into their relationship, Harriet goes to the gaudy, a, essentially a college reunion. Um, and there she encounters, well, they call it a poltergeist. The, um, it's a small women's college in Oxford. It's part of Oxford University. Um, and the female... Um, faculty members are getting kind of concerned because weird things are happening. Um, they think that since Harriet is actually a mystery writer herself, she should be able to help them solve a mystery. Harriet tries, but things and things are escalating. Things are getting a little alarming. So she calls on Lord Peter to come help her out. And 
of course, they solve the mystery. And this one, I think, is rather unusual because there's actually no murder. Um, it's just this poltergeist, and we, we discover who done it and why. Um, and it deals very much with issues of women's education, because in the 1930s, the idea of women with um, university educations, especially someplace like Oxford, a very high um, prestigious college, um, were still open to some debate. Some people didn't think women, you know, what did they need to have an education for if they were going to stay home and have babies. Um, it also sort of deals with what the idea of a relationship, because remember Lord Peter has been wooing Harriet Vane for five years now, and Harriet is just very um, skeptical of how a relationship can work and what a relationship would do. So there's a rather serious um, discussion or uh, treatment of the idea of what a romantic relationship uh, means to a person, and that has to that does have something to do with the mystery as well. So there is some very serious um, discussion of issues underlying what is in some ways a rather um, lighthearted, uh, it, or has lighthearted moments. It's um, whimsical. It is whimsical, <laughs> yes it is. Um, it does, I will tell you, uh, big spoiler here, it does end happily, okay? <laughs> um, but this is one of my favorites. I, D Dorothy Sayers is a classic. Um, they've been around a long time, but she's still, uh, the quality of the writing, the, um, the, the characterizations, the mysteries are darn good mysteries. She, she really, the clues are there if you can find them. Um, it's just excellent. It, Really excellent work, really quality work. Um, Gaudy Night is one of, I think it's like, and I did, I looked this up also on our website, in our um, Books and Series database. It's one of 11 uh, novels that Dorothy Sayers wrote about Lord Peter Whimsey. Um, she also wrote some short stories, and the series has been um, continued by Jill Payton Walsh with, I think, somewhat uneven results. But um, I think this is one of the classic uh, series that you still might want to consider having in your library because I don't think it's ever going to go completely out of style. All right. Well, I grabbed up this book off a of digital uh, thinking I was grabbing a, a standalone. Uh, the Boy in the Suitcase title grabbed me from the minute I saw it <laughs> and, um, and was introduced to Nina Borg. Um, and it turns out she's not. It's not. It's standalone. It's actually the first of four books um, in a series. But um, she is, Nina Borg is a Red Cross nurse um, in Denmark. Uh, this book was actually, is a translation originally published a few years back um, in Denmark, and um, it's in the thriller category. It's darker. Um, it goes uh, well as a standalone, but it also introduces you to this character who, who can't say no when asked to do a favor for a friend. It's, uh, she actually works at a refugee crisis center, and that's how she tends to make her connections, which lead to these um, kind of very different and serious cases um, that oftentimes she leaves, she forgets about picking up her child from daycare or contact, call, giving her husband a call. In fact, in this one, she loses her cell phone at some point. And so um, she just focuses on what she said, yes, she's going to find, work things out till the end. Um, and this different series have her, you know, dealing with serious issues, immigration, genocide, um, abuse. Um, and then, of course, in this case, we have um, from the minute you open the book and she has unzipped a suitcase, she's been asked to pick up at a transit lock in a transit center locker by a friend 
and she discovers this a boy in the suitcase, barely breathing. That's when you first do your first sigh of relief. Okay, so he's alive. <laughs> I'm not giving away any ending here, um, but it leads her on, you know, to say, well, now I've got to figure out who this boy is, why he's in the suitcase, and what I can do to bring him back to his mother. Uh, one of the things that Agnit um, Fries and Lean Carabol do is they um, weave parallel stories. So you have Nina's story of from the beginning, but then you're inter as you're introduced to characters, you start to see where they are and what they're doing to, in a way, solve the same mystery, the same, but in the process, or in some cases, try to conclude the crime that they, they've they uh, uh, started um, because there was also supposed to be a suitcase with some money in it. So then you start to wonder why they're looking for money and they're also looking for Nina once they figure out she has the child. And so you are kind of thrown into it and those sighs of relief come and then you gasp again because something else, uh, you know, this is not your cozy mystery. <laughs> this is your darker thriller because, um, you know, even the main character can end up in a brawl, you know, that there's going to be violence and there's going to be some serious issues discussed amongst the characters or as Nina unfolds what what's going on um, and so yeah there's three more the, the the fourth one is not yet available in the US it comes out in March of 2016 mm -hmm. so if you get hooked you're gonna have to wait till then to get to the conclusion of uh, you know these characters and and it you know it takes place in this particular one two two different countries Denmark and Lithuania um, and the, because of the refugee center, you're going to meet characters from all over the world, and their situations and political in problems and all of that come into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we thought that mysteries were interesting because they do first bring up the idea of what do you do with series in your library. Um, so many mysteries, in fact, I think every mystery we've talked about here um, is part of a series. And I think publishers like series because they tend to um, help sell themselves. Mm -hmm. But what do you do? Um, do you just keep collecting? Um, th I think the series we talked about today, for the most part, are fairly short. Mm -hmm. But what about, you know, Hercule Poirot or some of those that are on or heaven help us the JD Robb the in-depth series um, what do you do when the series gets really long do you try to have whole part of the whole series uh, do you well, just have the most recent ones and Sue Grafton we're up to X from yes, A we are. We're, yeah. we're up to what, 20 what 24 then yeah. huh? so, what's she going to do when she hits Z <laughs> I, I don't know she go, might retire go but. Greek <laughs> um but, you know, this really is, um, I think some people would tell you to have series while they're going on. Um, yeah, as long as something new is being printed to yeah. continue. Yeah. Um, I would suggest that even that may end up being a little bit difficult. Well, and especially if you have, if book number three in the series was a paperback and it wears out and, you know, or it gets lost, mm -hmm. Do you replace it? Yeah. Or do you just say, well, you know, this series will end and will lose its appeal, and mm -hmm. so I'm not going to bother. I don't have the shelf space anyway. And whether the mystery, ha the series has a arc or not, a story arc. Yeah. If if you can pick up any one along the way and you're okay, then those missing volumes are not, you know, necessarily need to be replaced. But if there's that story arc that people want to know. Yeah. What happened between mm -hmm. this book and that book? 
then you've got an issue. Um, it seems to me that this is one of those places where some work with some of your neighbors might be in order. Um, if you know, for instance, that someone is collecting a particular series, maybe you could collect a different one um, and you can all share. Um, if, if the back volumes are considerably older, um, you know, maybe not everyone needs to have them. So I think I think that's one of the things that you can talk about doing. It would be lovely if we could talk about, well, we don't have to have them on the shelf because we can have them electronically. But so far the publishers... Well, the publishers don't always provide every single title in a series yeah. to a library for an ebook or an audiobook. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, depending on the publisher, they, the library can only have them for a certain number of checkouts or for a certain period of time. So once those checkouts are used up or the time has expired, then the library is faced with the issue of do we pay again for that same title or do we spend our money on other newer books? These are issues. They, they really are, and really, the there isn't any one-size-fits-all, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I think it also does mean that you kind of have to know what you're talking about. You you have to know what the series is, and there are places to find out. Um, you know, if, if you're not familiar with a particular series, you can find out. Um, and you have to keep track of how popular they are in your library. Mm -hmm. You really kind of mm -hmm. have to know. Um, how, how many times they're being checked out. So series do bring up problems, but they're very popular, and heaven help you if you don't have um, X. <laughs> Since we're all dying to find out what Kinsey Milhone is going to do next. Um, there's also, I think, a problem when we have some of our favorite authors uh, go to that great beyond. Um, these are some who mostly are recent. Edgar Allan Poe, of course, has been gone for quite a while. Although I would say you have to have his books because they really are classic. I don't know. Um, and there well, are, if those English teachers keep assigning them. Yeah, if they do, <laughs> yes. available somewhere. Right. Um, some of these series are done um, because the, the writer is no longer with us. Elizabeth Peters, who wrote the Amelia Peabody um, series, Ellis Peters, who wrote Brother Cadfall. Um, they're wonderful series. They really are wonderful books, and I would think a lot of people would enjoy them. In those those cases, they're his, they were set historically to begin with, so they aren't going to date. Mm -hmm. um, but they're they're done, and maybe you have to. Um, read those so you have room for some new things. Now, Robert B. Parker brings yeah. up another issue. Right. Robert B. Parker, uh, Dick Francis's son, has picked up yeah. his books. Robert B. Parker has... Um, act, um, there are right. a couple of different authors. There's a couple authors of different authors, authors who, who have picked up and his continued series. his series. Um, Same with Vince Flynn. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Someone else is finishing off his last book. And... Um, Ariana Franklin, her daughter, finished off her last book. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to dare pick up P.D. James. Um, she's come back from the grave and get you for it, I think. <laughs> um, but Someone just said that Vince Flynn is being carried on by Brad Thor. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. So um, there's that. Um, do you stop carrying a series when the author goes. Um, do you keep it because they're going to continue? Evidently, they feel continuing the series still makes money. Right. Um, and either, really, I would tell anybody to keep Brother Cadfile, but that's my personal opinion <laughs> because yes. I really enjoy Brother Cadfile by Ellis Peters. Um, mm -hmm. Could I justify keeping that if it meant that I couldn't have a lot of new things on the shelf? I don't know. Um, it's tough. These are tough, and you have to kind of make decisions. Right. Again, um, maybe you want to have uh, work with um, 
some of your neighbors and some of you can have some older mysteries while others of you have other older mysteries. I don't know. The, the, the one thing to consider there though too is that if you don't have them on the shelf, you can only people borrow them from another them. library or people can't discover them. Uh -huh. so. mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, and probably again, your, your uh, user's taste has a lot to do with what you keep. Um, you know, but these are issues and they're things that libraries have to grapple with. Um, that actually answers someone did type in a question yeah. that when you're limited on space, did you, do you delete half of the collection that is not popular or do you keep it? And I think it's what well, you said. It's going to depend on your situation. It is. And you're going to have to pay attention to what, well, if it is popular, obviously keep it and maybe pay attention to circulation records. Are these not going mm -hmm. out? Do you get rid of them? Or do you try and promote them more because you think they should be going out? I mean, you're going to have to. It's not something specific to mysteries, really, but to yeah. the collection. Oh, really. But mysteries, <laughs> certainly, I think, they have their own big, issues with yeah. the series right. and whatnot. Yeah. It also, um, do you keep part of a series, or do you make sure you have the whole thing? Mm -hmm. um, I can't help myself. Uh, that need for completion. <laughs> um, I like to have whole series, but maybe you do have just some of the volumes that gives people a way to discover the series, but it doesn't take up quite as much space on your shelf, and you can get the other. Um, interlibrary loan does mean that we have um, we have a way to to enlarge our collections when we need to. You just have to make sure someone else is actually keeping it. Yes, you do. And not right. reading it, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, again, cooperation is key. Um, and does classic mean we have to keep it? I would say Dorothy Sayers was classic, and you probably ought to have her. Um, but then I really like her. Maybe somebody who didn't like her wouldn't think it mattered. Well, and, you know, I like all of, I like almost every single um, Dorothy Sayers book, except yeah. Gaudy Knight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everyone has their own likes. Well, they, yes, likes. they do. Um, and you can't just keep what you like. Right. No, you can't. <laughs> you have to watch um, your personal opinion. <laughs> but, but it also, you can't just keep, you, you want to serve those people who come in the library every week, but you also want to serve the people who maybe only come in occasionally or maybe would come in if they knew you had some of this stuff. Um, so, again, uh, do you have all of Agatha Christie? I don't know. That's a lot of books. That is a lot of books. <laughs> um, and I think some mystery writers or readers are very much, um, they're just happy with the mystery. You know, because 33%, yeah. as you mentioned earlier, yeah. a third of the people who respond in mysteries, they'll eat up almost anything that has that mm -hmm. sticker on it <laughs> mm -hmm. that says it's a mystery. Well, yeah. mystery certainly, um, it creates a plot and it creates mm -hmm. uh, suspense. Mm -hmm. So uh, there really are issues with this, though. Okay, so how do you find out about new authors and detectives? We're talking about some of the... Uh, issues about keeping old ones, but there are new ones all the time. So how do you find out about them? Well, one way, of course, is the awards. Um, there are mystery awards, the Edgar Awards from the Mystery Writers of America. The Crime Writers Association is British, but of course nobody does a mystery quite like the British. The Agatha Awards are for cozies. Um, but Flavius won the dagger. <laughs> yeah, yeah she, Flavius won the dagger. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes some of, sometimes the old mis, I think you want to watch these. I don't think you have to follow them slavishly. I think you also have to think about what people in your library like, right? Mm -hmm. Because some of these get a little literary sometimes, I think. Yeah, just my personal opinion. They're just mysteries you don't like. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> But um, it is one of the things that you can watch, one of the, the clues for you. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a new tool. So take it away, Deborah, who's going to talk a little bit about this wonderful tool. Okay. And before we, we get into 
uh, new ones. First, I'm going to just talk about novelist in general for a minute here. And you all know that you can get to novelist through the Nebraska Access website. And I'm just going to click on novelist here. And it'll take one minute to come up, or hopefully not a whole full minute, but OK. What I'm going to search for first is an author. And I'm going to use Laura's um, example of Craig Johnson. And you'll notice it starts auto-filling. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. That just means that I am actually going to get his author record right off the bat. Um, the author record usually talks a little bit Sometimes it gives more detail about their writing history, but it always does give some um, idea of what genre they're writing in, their writing style, the book appeal, and things like that. There is also to the right, I'm going to just point out here too, read-alikes. When you're in an author record, you will get a list of other authors that write in a similar manner. And then in the center part, you do get a listing of the books that this author has written with the most current title at the top. Okay? It will also list, books are always first. It will also give you a listing of audiobooks that are available. Um, you could go to series. If he had written more than one series, there would be information there. More information about this author. Um, which in this case just mostly repeats. Sometimes there's more information. Um, and then uh, there are, okay, there are other, this site offers a lot of different lists mm -hmm. for different types of books that you might want to put together, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to books here for just a second and I am going to click on, you could click on the title and get more information about that specific title. But what I'm going to do right now is click on the series link, which will take me to a series record, a description of the series overall with its appeals, genre, etc. And then in this case, it lists the titles in the order that they were published. So the first book, the newest, the first book in the series is listed first. Okay, so all of the series titles are here. Again, you can find audiobooks. More about this series. This is where I would like to point out that there is a note here that says this series has been adapted to a television show. So you get other information like yeah. that too, things that go beyond just the books. Okay, um, and another example will take The Boy in the Suitcase. And, oops. And of course, if you you do have to get put in the proper, uh, you have to be spacing. Type, huh? Yes. <laughs> okay. You'll notice when you go to a title record, to the right, your read-alikes are now titles as opposed to authors. You get ah, read-alikes for mm -hmm. whatever type of record mm -hmm. that you are in. Okay. With a title record, it does give you a bit of a description about the book. Um, some appeals, storyline, pace, tone, etc. And then the first link, first tab, if these are available, are reviews. And the reviews that are included in Novelist most generally are from Booklist, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and Kirkus, if they're available. So the, those are there. The mm -hmm. big yes. things that we are as librarians right. read. Yes. Read, yes. Um, for, uh, under audiobooks, whoops, what happened here? I didn't click it. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, for audiobooks, it does tell us that there is an audiobook version available, and it gives us the narrator and the duration of the audiobook. And then if I went to more about this book, it would mm -hmm. tell me, because I'm on a book record, it will tell me how many pages, um, the publisher, etc. And also in the notes, it tells me that this was translated from Danish and it gives the Danish title. So just a bit of, um, a bit more information. At the bottom of each screen, you know, I've been mentioning appeals for each of these uh, items. 
and they do show up at the bottom of each screen in the format of offering you a, a way to search for those particular appeals. So if I had read this book, and what I liked most about it was that it was a Scandinavian crime fiction book, and that it was suspenseful, okay, I can pick those two and say search, and it will search for other books that have those same headings applied to them. And you'll notice then we get a totally different listing from what was suggested as read-alikes. And um, you'll notice the most current one right here is The Girl in the Spider's Web, which has really hit, <laughs> hit the bestseller list yeah. and is, um, is going great guns. So those are some of the ways that you can um, help a, a reader find more new authors and more books. If you know the books that they've been reading and what they like, Mm -hmm. You can go in here and find read-alikes or other books with the same appeals, okay? That's very helpful as a reader's advisor. Right. The talking books is, right. I use this all the time. Yeah. Okay, and we'll see if this is working this morning, um, working now. We had a slight hiccup. Aha, it's working. Great. Okay, under Browse by Genre, you can go in and find, we're going to scroll down to mystery. These are some of the different genres, but we're going to say explore mysteries. And you'll notice the first grouping under mysteries is forthcoming mysteries. And you can do a view all, and you'll get a listing of titles that are going to be coming out over the next couple, three months. So that's another way to find out what's coming. <coughs> yeah. I thought it was interesting that, that they broke down mysteries into several different kinds of categories. Yes. And, you know, we've been talking um, cozies or dark or, yeah. you know, mysteries actually, um, this is one little thing that I'm going to go back to, explore mysteries. Um, mysteries are all, there are all kinds of categories. Yeah. We talked about police procedural. We've got a sheriff. We've got a um, a police chief. We've got amateur detectives. Yes. We've got Here's historical. Yeah. Uh -huh. historical. Yep. There <laughs> she is. Um, and there she is again under cozies. Um, you have the noir and hard-boiled mysteries. Um, uh, there are just so many different kinds. There, there are it seems like one writer starts writing about some little thing like, okay, we've got a, the, it's a bookstore owner. Well, then yeah. you get a whole bunch of series that are about bookstore owners. Or you've got somebody who's doing, you know, quilting, has a quilting shop. So then you get oh, a yeah. whole bunch of other series that are craft related in some way. So The you know, knitting mysteries. Yeah, the yeah. knitting mysteries. <laughs> so those things um, are out there too that you can divide things by. So... Yeah, just a, one way to find new titles, okay? And we'll put uh, back to the PowerPoint. Well, and I thought this was fascinating, too, because you saw that they also um, would deal with um, ages. So mm -hmm. there were children's books in here as right. well as adult books. Um, I... I, novelist is one of those things that I could spend a lot of time with, but it's it's very useful. Yeah, it yeah. really is fun. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's go on. Um, if you need your Nebraska Access password to get into Novelist, and we know that Nebraska Access passwords change twice a year, and Alana will send it to you, and if you forget it, if you ask Alana, she'll send it to you again. Mm -hmm. um, but you can get into Nebraska Access, and of course, not only can the librarians use this tool, but their um, library users can as well. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> I was very excited. <clears throat> We're gonna get this. Um, there are some other things as well that you can look at. Um, Booklist does offer webinars, and here's two about mysteries that are in their archive. You can go to the archive of uh, webinars and look at the Booklist. Um, webinars, and you do get CE credit for them, of course. Um, there's the Stop Your Killing Me newsletter. This is actually a website, but 
Uh, you can sign up for a newsletter. So it comes in your email. It's uh, twice a month. And, you know, you don't even have to go look for it. It just shows up for you. And they will list new mysteries. They will list um, award-winning. Um, our links to the awards down there. Yes. Right. They, um, I think they do a really good job, actually. They, they really mm -hmm. keep up with a lot of series and a lot of popular series that are not real literary, which is what people actually like to read. Um, so I think the Stop Your Killing Me newsletter is a great um, thing to look at just to stay kind of aware um, of what's going on in, in the whole genre. Um, there are some books, um, and we have them here, and you can borrow them um, uh, if you're a Nebraska librarian. Um, so there are Reader's Guide kind of books on mysteries. This is one of them. We have more than one. Um, and the Adult Reading Roundtable, a group of people who are very, very serious about their reader's advisory, um, do studies of different genres. Right now they're doing, they're in the middle of a two-year study on mysteries, and there is some material on their website. So this is a, um, a it's a, a, a source of information to consider. Um, so there's lots of places you can find out about mysteries. Mysteries are a great big part of uh, most libraries' fiction collections. Um, we've only dealt with adult mysteries today, but really there are mysteries for all age levels. I've been reading mysteries since Nancy Drew. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, they bring people a lot of pleasure, and we hope that, uh, you know, this helps gives you some ideas and some maybe some new titles to investigate. Um, you can contact us anytime if you like. And um, mm. do we have any final words? Mm. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> uh, there are a couple of comments and things that came in through during the show. Do we have any last minute questions? Or and you know you don't have to read every title in a series yourself. But it does help if you read at least one title from a, um, an author from across the different types of mysteries, just mm -hmm. so that you have an idea of what the different types of appeals are. Yes. Um, I, I think you're right there. Um, sometimes we read things that... And, you know, it's surprising what you will find that you do like that you didn't know you would like. So mm -hmm. you, you do need to go out and sample Mm -hmm. um, I love um, what's her name? Sorry, the, 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 it's from Seattle. Reader's advisory Seattle. person. Oh, Nancy Pearl. Nancy Pearl. Yeah. <laughs> I like Nancy Pearl. I'm sorry. I love Nancy Pearl's um, rubric, which is um, what is it? If you're under 80, you take your age. And you subtract it from 100, and you have to read that many pages of a book before you decide you're not going to read the whole book. Oh, um, wow. If you're over 80, you you can just, you know, you can put it down any time. Um, <laughs> you don't have a lot of time to mess with that kind yeah. of thing. If <laughs> In other words, it, it is okay to sample books. Um, sometimes, even if you don't want to read the whole book, if you just read a chapter, it gives you a flavor. So um, there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah. And sometimes um, publishers don't promote books as mysteries. They promote them as, as suspense or thriller. Mm -hmm. But there's a crime there, so most people will read them as yeah. mysteries. Right. Well, I think that brings up a whole other issue that we haven't really dealt with, which is um, do you keep them separate or do you interfile them? Um, there are people who write mysteries but they also write other kinds of books so you you're gonna if you keep the mysteries separate you're gonna separate an author's works um, it's tricky mm -hmm. but anyway thanks thank you to everybody thank you okay. doesn't look like anybody had any urgent desperate questions they needed to ask you so okay but you guys do you know where to find them all um, if you do have any questions, uh, you just take an end of his life and it should come up. Um, so if you do have any questions, yes, contact. Uh, do you want to just pick it? 
Just there. <laughs> um, contact Laura or Deb or Cecilia, whoever, um, and they can uh, answer your questions. Um, I did, I think, capture all the different websites and links you mentioned. I'll go back and double check through the presentation just to make sure. So after recording, you guys all have access to all of those. They'll be um, um, along with the recording for the show and the slides themselves, too. So um, you'll have all of that available to you um, afterwards. And that, thank you guys very much for attending, for doing well, this you, for us. That was great. Um, lots more books that I now need to write, you know. Read, of course. This always yeah. happens whenever we do one of these. Got to write that one down. Got to remember to get that one. Yeah. <laughs> I got the next play. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. It was recorded, as I said, and it is will be here in our archived Encompass Live Sessions links, which is on our website, where we post all of our shows afterwards. Um, let's see. Last week. We have the recording, the presentation, and this one this one happened to have an extra um, handout, um, and the links. Um, so this one will all be on there for you, uh, probably available later today. You'll get an email to let you know when I've got it done. Um, that will wrap it up for today's show. Hopefully you join us next week when we are talking about books again. Um, ne Nebraska's One Book, One Nebraska, where we read everyone in the state. Well who wants to, reads the same book each year. Um, this year it's uh, Death Zones and Darling Spies, Seven Years of Vietnam War Reporting, the Beverly Deep Kiever. I think that's how you pronounce it, Deep. Um, and so next week we'll have people joining us from the Nebraska Center for the Book to talk about the um, this year's um, program and the book that we're um, everyone is reading. Um, and then also sign up for any of our other shows we have on here. Um, we've got our um, new, new topics always coming up on here, so keep an eye on it. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, do go ahead and like us over there. You'll get reminders, as you see here. I told you to be reminded her this morning. Don't forget to log in. When the recordings are available, I post it on here. When any new things are coming up, I post it on here as well. So definitely like us over there on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user. Other than that, that wraps up for this morning. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye. 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 There we go.